Impatience is a bad plan every time. I can tell you in my own life, every time I act out of impatience, it's never a good thing. I live and work in an environment of impatience, pushing, trying to get more out of you or everyone else around you than is wanted to give. But it lives in an impatient world. We live in an impatient world if you look around us and look at all the mess. We don't want to wait on anything, right? I can tell you right now, if I pull into the local drive through and they ask me to pull forward, they'll bring it out in two minutes, I'm upset. I came through here in a hurry. You want me to wait two minutes? Are you kidding me? We want things like that. We get impatient. The people of God, the Israelites, were impatient. You see, they had been wandering around for near 40 years in this wilderness. And it was time for them to head for the promised land. All they had to do was to pass through their cousin's homeland. Those in Edom were Esau's uh, descendants. And they just needed to go through. They promised they would go through and wouldn't mess anything up. And those in Edom said no. Now at times when people refused them, God came and fought their battles and took care of the people. But in this case, he said it's time to go around. Now going around and having patience and listening to God and following his will wasn't just that easy. We're talking a few million people who had to move back south all the way to the Red Sea, then to go east past Edom and then turn north again, essentially making a horseshoe around this land that they should have just been able to cut through had their cousins allowed them to. And they were told no. They became impatient, so who did they blame? Moses and God. They went after Moses and God, began to murmur, began to complain. They didn't just complain about the travel, but they also said, we're sick and tired of this food. Now, at first they said there's no food, but then they said this worthless food. What worthless food were they talking about? They're talking about a 40-year daily miracle. We just talked about one miracle. This was a daily miracle. For 40 years, God fed them with quail and manna. They didn't even have to work for their food. It came right to their front door. Go out and gather it. And now they're upset. They're frustrated. They're mad. God wanted them to persevere. Understand that the people who are complaining are not the people who came out of Egypt originally and complained about everything. Remember, they left the leeks and garlics. We're 40 years into a journey. See, those people refused to go into Israel and take the land, and God had made them wander around for 40 years. This is their children that are complaining. They are the, they're the children of the original complainers. It, it's a family heritage now, right? It's lineage. Let me just say this. We don't have to follow in those footsteps. If you had a family member, so often the alcoholic has children who are alcoholics. The addict has addicted children, and it's almost expected. You're a loser here. You expect your children to be a loser. And I'm not here to be a, uh, you know, pump you up. I'm here to say that in the Bible it says we don't have to be and do that. that. That chain can be broken. That father who is extremely angry doesn't have to have angry children. They can decide not to be. God can help to break that cycle. Whatever it is, it can be broken. But these children had learned from their parents. They had learned to complain. They had become entitled. They just expected, and they were upset about what had been given to us, to them. How often are we upset about what God supplies for us? We want better. We want what we want. Let me tell you, this sin was costly. It was pricey. And those sins that we hang on to 
and continue on with become pricey. A lot of people got hurt. A lot of pain was involved. A lot of misery and certainly a lot of death. When God sent these fiery serpents, he sent them among the people. They begin to bite the people and the people begin to die. The people recognize this. They, they've been traipsing around this place for 40 years. They kind of know the area. So these fiery serpents suddenly attacking them weren't normal. And they recognized, we have sinned. We've, we've gone against God and against the leadership that God has put in front of us. Their salvation was in their repentance. When they repented, when they went to Moses and said, we sinned, they recognized it, realized it. We've sinned. Can you pray? And God answered a prayer. It, was, it happened after they began to repent. They began to cry out and ask God to help them. I look around us today at our country, and I see the sins of our people the sins of our country, the millions and millions and millions of babies that are slaughtered. The fact that we've, this is, as a country, this is put out there. We've allowed our children to wonder who they are and to try to make that decision as though God hadn't already made it. Folks, these are tough things, but these are the sins of our country. The impatience, the I want my way. And there is a lot of pain and misery and death to be associated with those things. Don't think there's not. There is a price to pay. And God will bring judgment in some form or fashion. The fact is, the people turned and repented and asked forgiveness. And God told Moses to make a serpent, to put it on a standard, to put it on a pole, and to put it in the center of the camp. And when they were bitten by the fiery snakes, if they would turn, and see that standard, if they would turn and accept the healing. Now, when you think about being bit by a snake and the agony that would go with that, you think about it in in one time. What if you're the guy that had been bitten five times? Five times. Four times he's turned and looked at it. The fifth time he says, I'm just sick and tired of having to deal with being bit by a snake and goes to his tent and dies. All he had to do was turn and look at the snake and accept the salvation, the healing. But it took an effort. And in some cases, it may have taken a lot of effort just to be able to look at that standard, to to receive that healing. But that's what it took, the acceptance of that healing, the recognition of the wrongdoing and the acceptance of doing it God's way. Imagine if they had just marched down and around and went on in. Would have saved a lot of lives, would have saved a lot of heartache, a lot of misery, and a lot of problems. But no, they were impatient, they were murmuring, they were angry, and God began to bring uh, judgment on them. What's amazing is when he did bring the salvation to them of turn and look, God sent those snakes. God sent the fiery serpents to attack the people, to bite them, and if they didn't receive the healing, to die. Why didn't he just send them away? He brought them. He could have removed them, right? How often do you and I deal with problems in our life and it's like, 
God, why don't you just take this away? God, take this away from me. Just get rid of this out of my life. And so often, God doesn't remove the problems from our lives. He creates a way through them. He takes us through those things. Why? Man, I don't know. I've been through some things I didn't understand, and I'm sure you have too. We could go down the aisle, and there's people that have been through things, and you don't understand. It makes sense. God, why couldn't you heal a loved one? God, why couldn't you just take this out of my life? God, why couldn't you just fix this situation? And he didn't. He provided a way through it. And that's what we find here with the Israelites. It was incredible what he used that serpent to do. And we see this serpent setting on the, they took this serpent with them when they left camp on through. It went on into Israel. Moses died. Joshua took over. They went into Israel, took it over. And for 400 years, there were the judges that they dealt with. Now we fast forward on a full 700 years later. This thing is no longer healing people but they have it in the temple. But they not only had this standard, the fiery serpent on a pole, this ancient relic saved in their temple, but they've also built temple or uh, altars to Asherah, another god inside the temple. Kings have come and gone. The judges are passed. And we find Hezekiah. 700 years later, leading the country. And Hezekiah began to clean things up. He wanted to follow God. And in following God, he went further than any of his predecessors had gone. Let's see how far he went here. In 2 Kings uh, 18.4 says, He being Hezekiah, removed the high places, he tore down, uh, the, the altars that were in the high places. And he broke down the pillars. And he cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. A precious object that God had used to powerfully Heal his people. Imagine the power of God. Literally, you're bitten by a snake, you turn, and God heals you. That is incredible. That is an amazing thing. A miracle, miracle on miracle. Like I said, what if you're the guy that got bit, bit five times, ten times, whatever, maybe only once. That'd be enough for me. I'd be dodging and ducking them things. I seen one going up the hill the other day. We were came out of a cave and were... This rattlesnake was this big around, about four foot long. Fortunately, he was going up the hill. I did toss a rock at him, and he slowed down. But my family was ahead of me, and they spotted it first. And then I came up, and I seen it. And I tossed a rock and watched it a little bit, and I turned around. They were all gone. They left me. <laughs> now, had he turned around, I can tell you right now who would have been first to the bottom of the hill. You're looking at him. <laughs> But these fiery snakes after them. Here, here we see in the, in the temple of God, a relic has become more important than God. Strange. And yet, how often do we do the same thing? You see, the thing that God had used, an object that God had used to bless the people, they had now in turn were worshiping it instead of God. Now where's the sense in that? And yet are they so much worse than you and I? In your life, in my life, what is it that you're thinking about right now? That's more important to you than God. What has God brought to your mind? I've seen people make their body a God. I've seen people make their abilities 
rely upon their abilities rather than rely upon God. I watch people make their business a God to them, worship it. Their money, our money, your money, my money, is it God's? Let me tell you this, everything you have above nothing, God gave you. If you got out of bed this morning and had a cup of coffee, and I had a few of them, if you put on clothes this morning, ate breakfast, climbed in a car to drive here, all of the things that are in our lives that become so important to us, God gave you. God gave you the ability to obtain it. Everything. Everything. The electricity that you plugged something into this morning. Everything in our lives. The homes that we live in. You know, Joplin's in Honduras right now with the team. And we talked about in Honduras, most of those people live on an average of $80 a month or less. Some of you will spend that much for lunch today. Where is our treasure? Does God have it? What are we worshiping? What is it that is all about us? Me, mine, can God have it? God gave it. Is there anything in your life that God can't have? Anything, your job, your car, your home, your spouse, your children, grandchildren, family members. What is in your life that is off limits to God? He gave it to you. Can he have it? If he takes it from you, will you become impatient and turn from him? If he requires it, for whatever reason, do we truly trust God? Are we willing to give him everything? Everything. If the answer to anything is no, there's a problem. There's a problem. Only you and God knows, and he may know better than you do. Your heart. He knows your heart. Is everything you have God's? Your health. You know, when I talked with Marcio yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening, to ask him how he was doing and talking about it, and he said, well, I could be better. I could have a perfect body. And I could be walking streets of gold. I like that attitude. It's not easy to have. But when you face death and God's brought you back and gave you, pretty quickly we begin to strip things down and understand what's important. Where are you? That's the question this morning. Where are you? Jesus actually Address this in Mark 10, verses 21 and 22. He was talking to the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. I love that piece. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. He knew why he came to him. He wanted to know how uh, to, to make heaven. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Everything else. The young man had everything but one thing. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. I just wonder, had that young man said, okay, and walked away and gave everything, what kind of plan did God have for him? What would Jesus have done with that young man? You see, all the apostles, including Paul, cost them their life. This young man might have died a pauper and lived a king 
in the next world? I don't know. But instead it says in verse 22, disheartened. The young man was deflated. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Folks, we have to examine ourselves. Have you given everything to God? Because he essentially bankrupted heaven. He gave the best that heaven had to give for you and I. He gave everything sent to this earth. What will you give him? Everything? Will there be temptations in and along this way? Absolutely there will. One of the things I love uh, about the Bible is, is the types, the shadows, the things that show up. And in Acts 28, verses 3 through 6, we see Paul. Paul has been shipwrecked. He was told by God he was going to Rome. Um, he did. Spent time in Rome eventually, and they cut his head off. He died uh, for the gospel. But in chapter 28, we see where Paul has uh, been shipwrecked. He was on his way, and uh, it was a terrible storm. And they didn't just lose some stuff, but literally the ship was destroyed, and yet all lives were saved at this point. They've made land, and the uh, natives there on the uh, island have taken them in or taken care of them. And they built a fire, and so Paul, in the spirit of, is trying to help build the fire. And here's where we find him. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out and because of the heat had fastened on to his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. And herein lies the temptation. God has done a miraculous thing right here. In fact, if you go back and look in the 16th chapter of uh, Mark, uh, the doxology as Jesus goes into heaven, one of the statements he made to the people as he commissioned them out was, You'll handle snakes and it'll hurt you. Not much after this, we see Paul being bit by a snake in the service of God, and it, uh, he was not hurt. Miraculously, God saved him. The temptation now is the people considered him a god, and Paul had to deflect that. But I want to take a look at the fact that out of the fire, out of the, Paul's in one of the worst times of his life. And out of that, a snake latches onto him. And in that, I've seen this. Satan will attack you at the most inopportune time. If you're at the height, man, life is going good. You've won whatever. You're at the top of, life just feels really good. And you want to just relax and step back a little bit and take it easy. Look out. The devil is coming for you. As well as often when we're at the lowest points of our life, how much lower could you be to be on your way to have to stand before Caesar and be shipwrecked and nearly killed? Paul was in a bad way. And the devil came after him. And when we have those temptations, we'll do one of two things. We'll hang on to it, we'll fall for the temptation, we'll deal with and, and fall into sin, or we'll turn and we'll look to Jesus. And when Paul shook that viper off, he was essentially turning and looking to Jesus, trusting God. God had told him, you're going to Rome. And Paul then had to resist the temptation to let the people make him a god. Incredible what Paul did there because he knew who he was. He knew who God was. He had given everything to God. There wasn't a question. He wasn't concerned 
about pulling that back. We must turn to Jesus. And I always love to address and see those, these things in Jesus' words if possible. The greatest preacher ever, right? I love to study the words of Jesus. And Jesus addressed these things in John 3. In the 14th and 15th verse, he said this, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You understand, Jesus just compared himself to the serpent on the standard that was raised to save the people. Listen, the people would have been, you're sick and tired of being, being bit by snakes. The last thing you want to look at is a snake being held up on a standard. And when we turn and look at the cross, It's not a pretty sight. We see the cross often, and it's painted up pretty. Jesus is hanging there. We know there was suffering, but it's made to look good. But had you seen Jesus, he was beat to a pulp. He would have been black and blue with a a crown of thorns on his head, blood running down, beat. His visage was unrecognizable. His back beat into hamburger meat, shredded. That's the Jesus that really was hanging on that. And he was hanging there wearing our sins. That's the weight that was on him. That's what was on him. That's what we have to turn and look to. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, held up on this pole for the whole world to see. Jesus didn't have to go there. But he had to go there for you and I. Why? He died a death that even if we had died, wouldn't have paid the price for what we did. And yet Jesus hung on a cross, wore all of our sins. It was a horrible, horrible scene. It wasn't pretty. There was nothing pretty about it. Why did he do it? He tells us in verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He didn't hang on that cross to make us feel bad. He hung on his cross to, as the song sang earlier, cross that chasm and create a way to heaven, a way for us to be saved, a way for us to spend eternity with him. What did he ask for? that we would give ourselves to him. It's not simple, or it's not complicated. It's very simple. It's very easy. It's not something that's hard to do. Chris, if you would come, I want to ask a question. What must a person do to be lost? What must a person do to be lost? What must a person do to go to hell? The answer is absolutely nothing. Just continue on doing what you've been doing. If you're living in sin, you're well on your way. That is all you have to do. You don't have to make a change. But the offer has been made. The price has been paid. The standard has been raised. And if we'll look to Jesus, the bite of sin, can go away, can be healed. It is not pretty to look at. It's ugly. But to see the sin of ours that has been laid on Jesus is an incredible thing to see.